I find the vision transformer to be quite an interesting model. You see, the self-attention mechanism and the transformer architecture were designed to help fix some of the flaws we saw in previous models that had applications in natural language processing. With the vision transformer, a few scientists at Google realized they could take images instead of text data as input data and use that architecture as a computer vision model. And they built a model that now has state-of-the-art results on image classification and other computer vision learning tasks. Let me show you how they did that. Let's dig into the vision transformer. The vision transformer comes from a paper that has been published by Google in 2020, and it captures a process on how to feed images to transformers. It is actually a pretty surprising paper because they were able to use a typical transformer architecture, feed images to it. They were able to build models that had performances on par with the typical convolutional networks. It is surprising because uh, convolutional networks have been dominating the fields of computer vision for a long time now. So it is interesting to see a model that is able to perform on par or even better than convolutional networks. So with the vision transformer, we start from an image. So we need to find a way to feed that image to the transformer architecture. The typical way to do it is to think about an image as multiple patches. So we break down the images into small patches and we're going to look at those different patches individually. So we need to go from a set of visual patches to vectors. And we need to be able to control the size of the vector independently on the image that we are feeding to the model. The way to do it is to take those patch of images and to put them through a linear transformation. And we're going to look at this specific linear transformation later, but now understand that we can find a linear transformation that takes a patch of image and transforms that patch of image into a vector of a size D model. And this will be the input that we will be able to put into our transformer model. So we're going to iterate, we're going to take each patch and we're going to transform each of those patch into a vector using the linear transformation. So we iterate and we have all the different patches that are being transformed into a set of vectors. So this is a sequence of vectors that we're going to be able to use to input into our model. Think about those patches as visual tokens. The model is going to use those as input and through the attention mechanism, it's going to try to understand the nonlinear relationship that happens between the different patches in that image. So the model is going to be able to understand how the different patches of images interact with each other when it comes to inferring on the specific learning task that the model is being trained on. So let's try to understand the linear transformation that gets us from a patch of image to a vector. Earlier, what I showed you was an iterative process where I was looking at each patch of image and I was passing them through the linear transformation. By using the magic of a convolutional layer, we're able to transform all those patches all at once by passing the image through the convolutional layer. Because a convolutional layer is basically a set of matrices, it's actually very easy to parallelize the process. So let's look in details. To make it work, I need to make sure that the kernels have a size of the patch size. The patch size is a dimension of the patches that I'm going to use on the image. The idea is to slice that patch over the image and to break down that image in patches. So the kernels have the size of the patch size. If we want the resulting vectors to have the dimension D model, then we need D model number of kernels. So by choosing those hyperparameters for the convolutional layer, we ensure that we control the resulting vectors that are being produced by this convolutional layer. When we pass this image through this convolutional layer, we end up with a resulting tensor. The size of this tensor is dependent on the convolutional layer and the number of patches that we have in this image. If you look in the right direction, here you would see all the different vectors that we talked about earlier. If you look in the Z direction and the X direction, what you see is a number of patches that relates to the image. So here we have six different vectors 
that you can find in that tensor. We have six different vectors because we have six possible patches that will go on that image. If you look at that image, you can break it down on the width with three different patches. That's why here, that on the y dimension, we have three different cubes in that tensor. Similarly, if we look in the height of that image, then we have enough space for two patches. That's why we have only two cubes in the z direction in that tensor. If I look at the first patch, because of the specific dimension of the convolutional layer, the first vector here will correspond to the first patch here. The second vector that I see here will correspond to the second patch here. The third vector here will correspond to the third patch here. And I can do that for all the different vectors that belong to that resulting tensor. And I can look at the resulting patch here. Similarly, we have that vector here that corresponds to that patch here. And to finish, we have that vector here that corresponds to that patch here. So we were able to produce a whole tensor by passing the image through the convolutional layer. The convolutional layer transformation is a simple linear transformation. It just reshapes the image in the right format for us to be able to fit the right dimensional tensor into the transformer architecture. Let's come back to that image. So we have this linear transformation. This linear transformation is actually the convolutional layer that we saw earlier. And here we have the different hidden states that correspond to the actual resulting tensor that we saw in the previous image. We are able to control the size of the vectors due to the size of the convolutional layer. But as we do for natural language processing application, we're going to use the position embedding to give the model more information on where are positioned the different patches. At this point of the transformation, when I look at this hidden state here, the model will not be able to know in what order the different patches of images are positioned. So we're going to use the position embedding to inform the model on where are positioned the different patch of image. So let's look at the first patch. It corresponds to the first vector in that position embedding. And we iterate. The second patch corresponds to the second vector in that position embedding. The third patch corresponds to the third vector in that position embedding. We iterate. The fourth patch corresponds to that fourth vector in the position embedding, etc. We iterate for all the different patches on the image. This way, the model is able to get the information on the position of the different patches and is able to reconstruct the original image. As we do in the typical transformer architecture, we take the visual tokens and we add them to the position tokens and we get a set of hidden states that will be able to fit to the transformer model. Something that is typically done is to add an additional classification token to the set of hidden states. This is just a vector that the model can learn that we add to the model. And this is usually used for classification tasks. This is also what we do for NLP applications when we want to perform classification tasks. We add an initial token at the beginning of a sentence such that we can use that vector as input to the prediction head and predict using that vector. You understand that we have as many hidden states going into the model that coming out from the model. Those hidden states, when they come into the model, there is no understanding of the different relationships that exist between those tokens. But the output hidden states that come out of the model, they capture the whole image or the whole sentence if we think about NLP. So each hidden state captures a different aspect of the sentence or the image. So we're going to understand a bit better after. So everything should feel quite familiar so far. We had the transformation that in the case of natural language processing was just a text embedding, so word or token embedding. And we have the position embedding like we had in the case of natural language processing. The resulting is a set of hidden states. And now we can input those hidden states within uh, the encoder part of the transformer. What was interesting with the vision transformer is that they made sure to keep the same architecture than in the case of attention is all you need. 
So the hidden states, they go through the multi-head attention layer, and the resulting hidden states are summed to the residuals. We are normalizing the resulting tensor to make sure that the gradients don't explode or don't vanish. We are feeding the resulting tensor to the fifth forward network. We are summing to the residuals, and we are normalizing the resulting tensor, and that is what is coming out from the encoder block. So the encoder is composed of multiple encoder blocks. So here was the first encoder block that we saw in the previous page. And the outcome of this first encoder block goes into the second encoder block. And we have a third encoder block. And we have as many encoder blocks that we need for the encoder to learn the relationship within the data. The outcome of that encoder is just what we call the encoder output. So we have an image, we pass it through the encoder, and we get as a result a set of vectors, the encoder outputs. Let's remind ourselves that if we added a classification token at the beginning of the encoder, then as a result, we will get as a final hidden state, a vector that would correspond to that classification token. Originally, when we inputted that classification token, the classification token was just a vector that didn't have any relationship with the other vectors. At the end of the encoder, all the different vectors capture different aspects of the image. So they all capture information about the image. And the vector that corresponds to the classification token can be used as an internal hidden state to predict the outcome that we're interested to predict. To predict something, the model needs the prediction head. The prediction head is usually a linear layer or a set of linear layers that projects from the internal dimension of the vectors to some vectors with the required dimension. Internally, the hidden states they have as dimension the model, but we would like to have as predictions vectors that have the size of the number of classes of the different object that we would like to predict. If we want to perform classification, each of those elements in those vectors represent an object, and each of those elements captures the probability that the model predicts this object is. So an object could be, for example, a car, a person, a truck, a toy, anything that we added when we were learning the multi-class classification task. The linear layer has as a number of input features the model, which is the size of the internal vectors and has as a number of output features the number of classes that we would like to predict. So we have as many rows in that linear layer that they are elements in each of the vectors that we predict. In the prediction matrix, we have as many vectors that they are patches in the image. And the number of patches is equal to the number of hidden states that we have in the encoder output plus the classification token. This is the number of patches plus the classification token. When we perform the task of classification, we only need one vector. We're going to classify the image among the possible classes that this vector has. So in the case of classification, we only use the first prediction vector. And this first prediction vector corresponds to the first vector that we have in the encoder output. If we had the classification token, then the first vector in the encoder output is a vector that corresponds to the classification token, and this is what will result into a set of predictions at the end of the model. So this is exactly how we would have done it if we had some text data instead of image data. So there's really nothing specific about text data. We can input some image data, but we could have used any other kind of data in that encoder, get some resulting encoder output, and project those encoder outputs in the prediction matrix that is interesting for us. <laughs>